Thank there you, you go. Sir. Awesome. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on, somebody. I'm just kidding. Jokes, jokes, jokes. That was awesome. That worship. Oh, my gosh. That was good stuff. Thank you, guys. Let them know. That was special. I've been some places, and I'm like, <laughs> God, where are you? And uh, <laughs> I mean, I know he's there, but I'm like, <laughs> but you walk in, you go, he's here. He's here. When he shows up, anything is possible. Amen. Amen. And uh, I'm excited to be here tonight. Been counting down, not the days, <laughs> the months. We planned this in January. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and he reached out to me, Pastor reached out to me the other day. And he said, are you still coming? I said, heck to the yes, I'm coming. I'm not going to miss this. And uh, whenever you get to speak in your hometown, it's special. And God is doing something special in the church of Lodi. And I just want to take a minute um, I'm not the guy that goes to a church and just starts pumping up the pastors in the church because I feel like I owe them something. I do believe in honor, and there's different ways of honoring. But I'll, I'll tell you this, and I, and I believe I, I've told uh, your pastor this um, every time I've met with them. There's such a spirit of excellence in this house, and excellence truly honors God. You walk up in the parking lot, you got the pad out there, you got the families out there high-fiving and welcoming people, and it's not like the Walmart greeter kind of welcome. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with the Walmart greeter. If you're here, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You've got a tough gig, but it's people really enjoying the family of God. And I walked up again today, and I went, man, I'm just reminded of what you guys are doing here, such a light in this community. And so, pastors, thank you for this opportunity. And I truly, truly, truly believe with all my heart, um, and this isn't a courtesy word, I, 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 I believe you guys aren't, like, heading into, I believe you guys truly are in the, sh the shallows of the greatest um, uh, season of uh, fruit that you've ever seen. I mean, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is about ready to hit this place, so get ready. And T.G. Jakes would say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, right? And uh, But I, I truly believe you've been preparing for such a time as this, just showing up, being faithful, loving people. That's really what it's all about. And uh, so tonight I, I, I'm going to create, I'm going to speak real fast. It's going to be kind of like a message on ADD. Uh, I have scriptures. I don't know which ones I'm going to use. I may use them. I may not. I may misuse them. No, I won't do that. I promise you. Um, have you ever heard something like quoting scripture and they preach and you're like, that ain't that scripture. I'm not going to be that guy. And, uh, and I, cause I, I peek in on y'all on, on when you, on Sundays and I'm watching, you know, I'm like, they, they, you guys can preach. You both, you can preach. And, uh, so you guys have a good here. And I'm like, man, yeah. And, uh, I'm like, I got to follow up that dear God. All right. Help me Lord. But, um, but no, let, let what happened at the dream sun, it just be a prophetic Im image of what God is going to do here and is doing here. And that was a fun time with Tommy Barnett. And, uh, but let me dive into this before we do that, though, do me a favor and just turn to your neighbor and say, you know what? You look good tonight. <laughs> now do me another favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love creating awkward moments in the church house. Because some of you weren't sure, should I tell them? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you're married. You just, you know, but do this. Do me another favor. Now turn to your second choice and tell them you look good too. Because <clears throat> we don't want anybody left out in the house of God. All right. So everybody's feeling good. Everybody's looking good. And uh, yeah. So, right, right. And if they look really good, you can kind of elongate the good. You, know, you look good. And you can do it in that deep, very white voice, too. You look good. Anyways, we're in church. Let me get to the point. First Samuel 17, 17 through 24. Let me paraphrase this, but this is where we're going to launch out into. It's kind of going to create a, a prophetic framework where I believe the church has been. And I'm going to I'm going to end where I really believe you guys are, okay? This church, I'm going to speak uh, where the church at large is, and I'm going to end it where I believe this church, your house, this local community, family is. I was in <clears throat> Romania and uh, speaking, and, uh, you know, you're there on a, on a, speaking in different churches, and, and uh, you know, there's always someone in the crowd, right? There's always, I don't, maybe you're here tonight, I don't know, but someone that stands up and says, I, I've got a word for you, Pastor, and, I, and that kind of scared me. <laughs> I'm like, you know, what, what do you mean you got a word for me? And, uh, but, I, you know, it was his church, and I said, well, you do whatever you want, and, and he says, um, and I'm nervous, because I don't know what's coming next. You know, and uh, cause I, I, you know, anyways, and he, he says, you got the, uh, the Ishakar anointing on your life. 
<laughs> you know, the men in Vishakar, they understood the times. And because they understood the times, they knew what they should do. You know that, that scripture, right? And, um, and, and it's a good passage. And, and it's true. The men of Ishakar understood the times and they knew what they should do. And he says, you got the Ishakar anointing. Pastor, I, I, I didn't even know if that was legal to have an Ishakar anointing. <laughs> I'm like, can I have that? What is that? And, uh, but I, you know, my prayer tonight is that we do have the ability to have a supernatural understanding of what God is doing in this particular moment in history. Not what we think he's doing, not what we want him to do, yeah, yeah. but what he's actually doing. So we can partner with him and work with him and shift things in our city and the world. Because so often the church, I believe, is working out of season, right? We're working out of where we want to be. Like, I want, I want strawberries year round. Come on, somebody. Yes. But there is a season when star, strawberries aren't meant to be eight, right? And, and they're not ready. And you, you, you take that strawberry that can produce so much joy in your taste buds and make your tongue do, you know, do a dance, right? And you eat that out of season, you'll be puckered face, bitter beer face, all the bad face, all, all of that, right? But we have to understand the season in which you're in. So I pray for this house that you guys would have an understanding of the season that you are in so you can strategically partner with the king and partner with them in the city and release what he's wanting to do when he is doing it. I've worked out a season before and it's no fun. It's a grind. But when you begin to work in alignment with him and in season with him, you know what? Things begin to happen. There's a grace for that. So in 1 Samuel, I'm going to paraphrase, you know the story well, and it's, it's, it's David, it's young David. He's already been anointed king, but he's not yet king. Hey, how hard could that be? You are going to be the king, but not yet, boy. <laughs> this is going to be your life, but not yet. Right. He still had to show up and do shepherd boy things and, you know, be the runt of the family, be overlooked, all the stuff, all the while carrying, you know, the, the promise of you're the next king. Right. And I believe that was a test. You can have all this, but let's see what you're going to do with what you have in the right now until you your time comes. And so he's just he's tending his, his flock and he's probably just, you know, rethinking, overthinking his life, you know, and, and that's that's a whole message in itself. You, you grew up probably in church, you know, the story, right? Overlooked. Father didn't even claim him. Come on, that's a bad day, somebody, you know, <laughs> you got one more son. No, I don't. And the prophet says, yes, you do. Right. And that's kind of like the story of his life. But but he's anointed king. So <clears throat> he's doing his thing, being faithful with the little before it's time for his assignment, not even knowing when his time would come. And you see, sometimes that's the thing. You don't know when your time's going to come. You just keep showing up. You just keep showing up. You just keep showing up. You just keep praying. You keep fasting. You keep doing. You keep believing. You keep sowing. And then at some point, things shift and, and, the, and the heavens begin to open, right? And, and it's your time. And so his dad says, and this is my paraphrase, and I, you know, I have the mic so I can tell the story however I want to. I, this is the way I say it. Hey, boy, <laughs> get over here. <laughs> yeah, I want you to take these, and I'm paraphrasing now, so that, don't quote me verbatim here, but I want you to take you know, uh, some cheese, and I want you to take some uh, crackers and some bread to your brothers. You know, they're at battle with the other Israelite, you know, army, and they're going toe to toe with the Philistines. And I want you to take some bread. Think about that for a minute. You're going to be the king and your dad says, take your brother some cheese. You're not even worthy of battle yet. Take him some cheese. I would have said, and this is why I'm not in the Bible, y'all. I would have said, heck no, pops. You take the cheese. <laughs> I'm going to be the king, you know, and but, you know, and so but he does it. And this is such a huge part of his story. He obeys his father. I don't know if it was, you know, begrudgingly and he just gave me the cheese and went. But he took the cheese. He took the, how do you say, it? charcuterie board, charcuterie board, charcuterie board, right? Probably the very first one in the history of mankind takes it to the battle lines to where the Israelite army was facing the Philistines. And he gets there and he's kind of doing his thing, shows up, and then he sees something. But what he sees is really where I want to really launch into. And I believe this is, a, a, again, a prophetic uh, framework where, where the church at large has kind of been. But I do begin believe things are beginning to shift. So he gets to the battle, he kind of checks in with his brothers and, and gives them the cheese and makes sure they have everything they, you know, he was supposed to give them. Right. And, and so he sees the, the army coming down 
to the battle line, drawing, you know, the, the line in the sand. And then he saw this Philistine giant, right? You know, this huge beast of a man, you know, um, taunting them. And, and, and they were shouting loud. They were making all kinds of noise. And I can just see them just banging their chests and wearing their Christian t-shirts. And our God is an awesome God and greater is he. And, you know, all the, all the stuff. They, they had the bumper stickers on their camels. I, I mean, they, they, they had all the stuff making a lot of noise. And then something happens. The Philistine comes up to the battle line and the army turns and retreats and runs back to camp. Let me, let me, let me just sit here for a minute. Young David, he's not king yet. He, he's just being obedient to what his father said. He has no idea. See, we have the privilege of looking at the whole scripture. We know what's about to happen. We know what happens next. He's about to create what we know happens next, right? And, and, and you, as you read it, you're like, come on, you can do it. We know. He didn't know. He shows up and he sees him retreating. And there's one part in there that says, you know, he, he ran to and they were running from, right? Uh, let, me, let me just say this. Can God trust you with the cheese? I mean, like, seriously, because he, he, God was able to trust him with the cheese. It set him up for his, his ultimate destiny, what God he was created and called him to be, to be the king. It set him up. Yeah. See, if God can't trust you with the cheese, then he can't trust you with the crown. And we want the crown, but we don't want the cheese. And don't worry, I'm not going to be the guy that says, you know, if you're not scrubbing toilets and God can't use. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, I mean, we'll just leave that there. Right. But he was faithful with that, and he sees this sight. And I'm camping here for a minute on purpose because I want you to see it. He shows up, and he sees the army of God making all the noise, cranking their worship, doing their things, saying how awesome God is, and all the things and the, that they did and do. And, and then when the giant came, they turned around, and they retreated and ran away. And he's like, oh, heck no. You know the rest of the story. He ends up going toe to toe. No armor. Just a few smooth stones. Only needed one. Works it up real good. Slings them. Perfect shot. Giant goes down. Right? And this, this, this is spoils over this. I mean, there's so much on the line here. I mean, it's basically this. You know, if you win, you serve our God. If you win, you serve our God. And yet the Israelite army of God was retreating from this. And he says, oh, this time, this time, let's build a stage and let's show off how awesome and mighty our God is. He didn't run from the giant. He ran to the giant. Slings the stone, hits the giant. Giant goes down. You know the story. See, most people get excited when they, they just, they knock the giant down. They start doing the happy dance, Right? Giants down, we won. Giants down, it's over. I remember in football one time, I, I, I was back, you know, in, I was like eight years old. And I, I, was a, I was a pudgy little guy. And they put all the pudgy little guys on the line. That's just what they did. <laughs> and I was playing on line, and I just fell down in the end zone, and the football landed on my stomach. And I was smart enough just to squeeze that thing. And I got up, I put the ball in the air, and I was doing the dance, and I was like doing this in the end zone and all the stuff. And my coach got in my, my girl, he says, act like you've been there before. <laughs> I said, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what we often do. We knock down our, our giant. But it wasn't good enough for him. He knocks down the giant, and then he goes up, pulls out the giant sword with his own sword. That's like, that's like beast mode. I mean, he didn't like, he, you know, borrow a sword from his brother. He got the, his enemy's sword and, and, and cut his head off. And that's so significant. See, sometimes we get excited because we knock down giants. Let me make it more personal. Let me, this per, I won't, I'll speak to me. Sometimes I, I get excited, I'll knock down a giant. But if I don't kill that giant and cut off that giant or that Goliath that I'm facing... There's a chance that Goliath might come back in my kid's life. Because the giants I fail to slay and face, my kids are going to have to slay and face. The giants I don't kill, my kids will have to kill. See, we sing songs like, this is how I fight my battle. Let me tell you why I fight my battle. 
Because I understand the, the, the Goliaths I don't face, the Goliaths you don't face. Your responsibility to face them, your kids and maybe your great grandkids are going to have to face them. They may be down for a generation, then they just pop back up out of nowhere. Like, where'd that come from? He was still alive. He was just down for a minute. See, when I run my race, I want to make sure that my, I have grandkids now. I know I look 21. I know that. <laughs> and the fact that you laughed louder at that than anything else I said, you, you, you don't agree. That's all right, though. Tell your neighbor, you don't look good. Tell them, no, don't say that. But I understand all my grandkids, and that's why for me, I'm 52 years old, you know, and I'm like, I, I, I got a lot of life left, but I'm like, I, I know I have, to be very, I have to be a good steward, and I have to face things in my life, because if I don't, my, my grandbabies will have to face them. So he cuts off the head of, of the giant to make sure there's no chance he's coming back. That's not even the message, but that's just kind of a little side note. So cut off your Goliath's head. To make sure they don't come back to life. So he does this. But the, the framework was this. And I really believe the Lord said, he said, that's really the picture of the church. We make a lot of noise. We say things we don't really believe. We sing songs we don't really believe oftentimes. Not this church, but I'm thinking the church in general. And, 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 and so often, you know, the enemy shows up and we retreat, we run. We were never called to run from the battle. We were called and are called to run to the battle. Write that down. You are a child of God, and your mandate is to run to the battle. Don't run from it. See, the church, I believe right now, the greatest revelation the church can have right now and needs to have, especially in this hour, is greater is he that is in you than the spirit that is in the world. Right? Greater is he that is in you. There's nothing. There's nothing that can stop you unless you retreat or you surrender. God is calling the church to run to the battle, not run from it. He's calling us to permeate culture, not run from it. In Matthew 13, 33, it says this. It's, a, it's, it's talking about the yeast. And it says Jesus also used this illustration. It says the kingdom of heaven is, is like yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put, only put a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. That's a powerful verse. It says the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like the yeast that the woman used to create bread. It permeated. Just a very little bit of yeast permeated the dough and affected the entire batch. If you don't put the yeast in, it doesn't affect the batch. And I believe, again, if you're taking notes, put this down. God is calling me. God is calling us. God is calling the church not to run from culture, but to permeate it and affect the whole batch. I know we're living in some crazy times right now, right? I mean, you don't even have to watch the news to know that. You can walk outside and just feel it. It's crazy out there. You just go on social media for just a, like a quick second, and you'll find out like this world has gone wild. Everything that can happen is happening. I mean, but here's the deal. And I hear a lot of people, I hear a lot of fear in the church. See, I hear a lot of fear. See, when you understand greater is he that's in you, you don't have to understand it, but you, you won't be afraid of it. See, there's a lot of things I don't understand and I don't get, but I ain't afraid. Because I understand greater is he that's in me. In fact, parent, who, who have kids? Who have, who have kids? That's bad English. Who have kids? <laughs> Who? Who got, Who got some kids? All right. One of the greatest gifts, lessons you can teach your child is, is, is greater is he that's in you. Don't be afraid. I mean, I mean, the devil, I mean, he got cooties, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get you. Greater is he that's in you. But see, when we're afraid, it starts, we're afraid of, to go outside. We're afraid to go to school. We're afraid to go in the mall. We're afraid to go shopping. We're afraid. I'll tell you what, we're not called to retreat. We're called to take ground. Get that in your notes. The church, me, us, I'm called to take ground. It's not being naive. It's not a lack of understanding the time in which we live. But again, understanding the time in which we live, have an understanding. Now we can know what we need to do. Run to, not run from. Run to, not from. You 
You know this scripture too, Matthew 5, 13. And I'm going to read out of the Amplified, forgive me. But I like it because it kind of amplifies it a little bit. It says, you are the salt. Now, I want to establish something. Who is he speaking to? This is, this is to you. This is to me. This is to the person you see in the mirror. This is to the church. He's not writing this to the heathen. This is to the church. He says, you are the salt. So we have to establish that. In this story, you are the salt. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are the salt. Or since I have bad English, I'll say it like this. You be the salt. This is you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt, you, you, the church, has lost its taste, purpose, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and walked on by people. When the walkaways are wet and slippery, key right there, get this, you are the salt. The church is the salt. Christ told us through his word, you are the salt of the world. And I'm not going to go into all the things salt does. Because you know, and you've, 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 you've heard it many times, I'm sure. But let me read this one more time out of the message. Now, you really got to forgive me. And don't be that person that that's not a translation. I know it's not, but it's good. Lots of adjectives in here that I just kind of like. He says, let me tell you why you are here. Isn't that good? That's, I like that star point. So let me tell you why you are here. He puts the finger back on the church. He says, this is why you are here. He says, you are here to be salt seasoning. Come on, barbecuers. Let's go. Let's go. Where, are my, where are my ribeye guys at? Come on. All right. All right. That brings out the God flavors of the earth. Isn't that powerful? You bring out the God flavors. Of this earth. That's our purpose, to bring out the God flavors. It's so easy to call out the pepper in people. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but it takes the eyes of Christ, really, to see somebody and pull out their, their God flavors. You can see the junk in their life, but it, but it takes godly eyes to see the prize in their life. He says, that's your purpose, to call out the God, the, the creative flavors of earth. And if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? I mean, this is personal. He's getting up in your business right now. He says, you, you, you've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Holy snap. That's, that's, some, that's some harsh language right there. You read that and you're like, don't talk to me like that. But he establishes the point. You are the salt. I am the salt. And if I lose my saltiness, what good am I anymore? My purpose is to pull out the God flavors in people. See, this is what I hear a lot right now. And, and, and if you're on, again, you know, social media of any type or the news of any type or just talking to people, it's like, it's like we, we, we're talking about they're picking on us, on us Christians. They're walking all over our morals and our ethics and our values. They're just trampling all over us. And, I, and, and I, then I read this verse, and I'm not in disagreement. But, but, but could it be what the scripture is talking about? I'm just throwing this out there. I, I am not speaking to you. I'm talking about the people that aren't here tonight. You know, you know who they are. But could it be we're being trampled on and our values are being trampled on because we've lost our saltiness? We're too busy doing what God's not doing rather than partnering with him and doing what he's doing because we don't know what he's doing. That's why we need to have understanding of a time in which we live to partner with him and do what he's doing now. I think sometimes the church is answering questions the world's not even asking. I remember I was in Bible college a long time ago, many moons ago, where like we had to bring a Bible. <laughs> we did. There was no phone. There was no iPad. There was no nothing. It was the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. That was all we had, right? We didn't even have GoFundMe to get someone to pay for our school. We had to use faith. <laughs> it's like, that's how old I am. <laughs> and I wish I had it. I'm not, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm just like, I could have got it all taken care of with one, anyways, one post would have got me, got me covered. <laughs> A little test. Where was I? You don't even know. <laughs> I was going to Bible college. And I was, I was there and I forgot why I was there. I forgot what happened. Oh my God. Oh man. Help me, Lord. 
I did. The salt. I'm thinking I was going somewhere. That's the problem with ADD. I, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll get it because it was that good. I forgot. It was so good. I for I forgot. But but the question at hand is this. Like like that's a personal thing. Like because because it's saying if you lost your your saltiness back in the day, this is what that meant. When salt lost its ability to do what it was supposed to do, they threw it out in the streets. When the streets were wet, it was like a pavement. It was a pavement, and people literally walked on it, and 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 walked all over it, and 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 so that's that's kind of like what I see happening in so many ways. We're losing our 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 our, our, our mission, our sense of what we're called to do. And now all of a sudden, you know, people are beginning to walk on us. And I'm like, and we're retreating. Listen, I want to say some things right now that I I just want to say. Christianity was never supposed to be a subculture of culture. We were never called to run from culture. Now, some of the things I might say may offend you. Please pray on it and don't get mad and, 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 you know, throw things at me. But but something happened along the way where we felt the need to Christianize everything. We don't have to Christianize everything. I mean, we don't have to Christianize everything we do and everything we do. And we don't need Christian toothpaste. We don't need Christian, you know, we, 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 we don't have to Christianize everything. And what we've done literally is, is, is withdrawn from culture. And we wonder why culture is so dark and it's so hard right now and things are so crazy right now. I, I believe the, the, a lot of the church has retreated from culture to create a subculture called Christianity. I'm going to tell you right now, we were never supposed to be a subculture. The mandate on the church was to make disciples of all the earth, not run over to a little tiny you know, island over here and just create our own little planet over our own little world over here and do Christian things over here. No, God called us to, to permeate the darkest places. Because I'm going to say something. The darker it gets, the brighter we shine. Come on, somebody. The darker that it gets, the brighter we shine. So it's dark out there. It's crazy right now. But rather than running, let's get excited because I know this, that the darker it gets, the lighter I'm going to shine. The, the brighter you're going to shine. Right? You know that song, the, this little light of mine? I'm a big old flashlight, somebody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it shine. I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to create some subculture. So where are we at in this? God's calling the church back to culture. To take back what the enemy has taken from us. And let me say, I don't even think he's taken it from us. Most of it, I think we've surrendered. I think a lot of it we've handed over and we just tucked tail and ran like, like the Israelite army. Rather than going toe to toe, understanding greater is he that's in me. Say, not on my watch, Mr. Goliath. We retreat and we surrender and then we wonder why our schools are what they are. We wonder why our colleges are what they are. We wonder why the the music industry is what it is. We wonder why the movie industry is what it is. We wonder why all these things are happening. And I'll tell you why. We've retreated and we've surrendered all these things that create culture in our communities. We've we've pulled out and we've retreated. And I'm telling you what, God is calling us to, to permeate and go back into these areas. With the understanding that is greater is he that is in me. Again, the darker it gets, the brighter you shine. I believe God has built a stage for this moment right now. I believe God has literally built a stage for the church. For this moment. But it's what are we going to do with it? Are we going to jump on it and go toe to toe and already already the winner? Are we going to retreat and continue to retreat? I got to be careful with that because I don't want someone to hear what I'm not saying. But we're the salt. We're called to create cultures. We're called to be the flavor. We're called to dictate the flavor of culture. I, I believe right now we're, we're, we're in, a, in a moment, and we've been, I think, the last half decade. I would say the last half de- decade has been just straight crazy. I mean, we've been through that, that uh, pandemic. We've been through crazy stuff. I mean, we've been through long, everything you can imagine we've been through. And I believe, you know, we were several years out of that. Uh, and I, but I think it's still crazy times. And, and I, I think everything that can be shook is being shook. I, I think the church is being shook. 
I think the government is being shook. I think the children of God are, are being shook. I think everything that could be shook is being shook, right? Oh, you come with gifts. Thank you. I like it. Be like, come on, somebody. Oh, God. <laughs> this is going to stick to my face. <laughs> It's like, I'll just stay right here and I'll. <laughs> but everything that can be shook is being shook. And, 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 and we have to understand that. So if we understand that, if we understand the times, we understand God has shaken everything that can be shook for a purpose. I remember we live in a beautiful area here in Lodi. There's ag everywhere. I remember driving through an almond orchard not, you know, a while back. And, and I seen this thing. It looked like this big old, like, um, like like robot thing. I never seen it before. And it, it was in between the trees and it had these big metal arms and it wrapped it around the trunk of this tree. And I'm like the curious cat. I pulled over and go, what's going on here? Right. And it, and, and it, and it started making this loud noise and then started just violently shaking. I mean, it was violent. It was like, I mean, where you couldn't even see the, the, the trunk anymore. We're so like going back and forth and, and the, the, the almonds, the nuts were falling off and, and all the, the dead branches were falling off and everything that can fall off that was ready or dead was falling off. And I remember God speaking to me uh, very profoundly. He says that what you see right there is what I'm doing in the church in this hour. I I'm shaking out all the nuts. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Who came, to, who, who came to mind when I said that? You all know some nuts? I'm just, you don't even, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. Right? But it was shaking off all the dead branches as well. Anything that didn't bring life was being shook off. And I believe everything in the church today that doesn't bear life, God is like not just pruning, but he's cutting. There's a difference. Pruning brings back to life, but there's also a cutting that the Bible talks about. And it shook all these dead branches. I know in my life, God is shaking off the dead branches. There's some dead faith. Come on, let's get, let's get vulnerable. There's some dead hope. There's some dead dreams. There's some things, you know, he's shaking it off so he can do the new thing in my life, in your life, in this, this house's life, right? He's shaking off the areas that aren't bearing life and bearing fruit. Why? He's getting us ready for the greatest outpouring in the history of mankind. Because the stage has been set. Pain seasons, pain seasons always, always, always precede gain seasons. I will. Pain seasons. Always precede gain seasons. So if you've been in the kingdom more than a minute, you get excited when, when you start feeling the pain. Because there's a bad pain. There's a pain without grace, but there's a pain that you have with grace. And you know when that comes, you're like, okay, I know what this is for. God's getting me ready for what's coming. And God is shaking the church to get the church ready for what's coming. So we'll stop retreating. So we'll stop running in fear. So we'll understand that greater is he that is in I than any spirit, anything that's in this world. That we win, all we have to do is show up and then take back everything the enemy has took from us, everything we've surrendered and laid down. Let me say it that way. Let me end with this. Because Christ was very clear on what he wanted the church to be. I, I, think, I think part of the shaking is this. God's shaking the, the corporate paradigm out of the church. Can I, can I just be real with you? The corporate paradigm does not belong in the church. It was never meant to be in the church. The church is not a corporation. Got to get this. I, and you already do. I know this. The church isn't a corporation. The church is a family. God didn't start a business. He started a family when he started the church. Right? And you read scripture and, and you see it. It's not like surprise. It's like right here. I mean, I know we, I know there's a bit, I pastored for 25 years. I know you got to count the money. I mean, <laughs> there's a, there's, there's a business aspect, but I believe God is purging that corporate mentality that puts a false pressure on preachers. How many are you running? How many you got on Sunday? They don't care about your family. They care about how big you are. I've been in meetings. I'm telling you, I walk in the room like, hey, man, how many you running on Sundays? Or, I'm like, how's your kids? <laughs> wrong question. <laughs> right question, but 
Wrong question, I guess. See, God, God is, is shaking us so we can get back to what he created us to be. A family. A family. This post, I think, I don't want to talk about the pandemic, but we're on this side of all of it, right? And, 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 and for a moment there, the coolest thing about it all was this, I want to say this, was it didn't matter how big your church, we all had the same size church. But the church was activated to be the church. I never enjoyed pastoring more in my life in that season because it wasn't about Sunday school. wasn't about well, not Sunday school. It's fine, but here in my heart, like, like who's going to teach it and who's going to watch the baby, all this stuff, and you're pulling your hair out and all the other stuff. You know, it was just like, how can we how can we love on people? How can we serve our community? How can we be the church? How can we? All of a sudden, it wasn't about air. It was just it was just this beautiful. I think in a horrific moment, a beautiful moment. Let me be careful with that because I know there was a lot of pain in that. But the new metric, I believe, moving forward is this. It's not, oh, yeah, man, how big your church is. There's nothing wrong with having a big church. But the metric for, uh, moving forward is this for the, for the church is, is impact and influence. Are you impacting your community? Are you influencing your, your community? Like, 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 and I know the answer to this question, but if you guys close the doors Sunday, it's not prophetic, just so y'all know. You just say, you're like, party's over, we're done, right? This community would know you were gone. I remember someone asked my staff that years ago, years ago, right? And they said, Some, if you guys walked away from this and closed your doors, you know, and, and walked whatever, would they know you were, you know, would, would, would your community know you were gone? I'm like, heck, heck, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, honest answer. See, the church that God endorsed and gave blueprints for, the community would know you're missing. They'd be like, where'd they go? And I, and I love this in Acts 2. This is beautiful. And this is really what I want to just, this is all that really just to say this. And, and, and I won't get sidetracked, I promise. And I'll just stay right here. This is the blueprint. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. You know the scripture. It says they, they sold property and possessions to, to give to anyone who had need. Uh, they're not making this stuff up. Like, like they sold stuff to, to, to meet the need of, of, of the brothers and sisters. That's like next level, like servanthood, giving spirit, all of that. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying, get this right here, enjoying the favor of all the people. That's key. It says, not just enjoying the, pe the favor of the people in the meetings, enjoying the favor of all the people while they were doing church. It says, and, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, I, I love what Tommy Burnett said, and Tommy was, was, was here. And, and he said, on, on a, for the first church, he said, in a bad year of evangelism and church growth, they, he said, a bad year, they grew 365 people. In a bad year. But it says, they found favor by, by, by everyone, not, not just those in attendance. Now, let me, let me read that same thought from the message, not the whole thing, but I'll, I'll get down to like the last little paraphrase. It says, they followed uh, daily discipline of worship in the temple, uh, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful. Those are some heavy duty adjectives. I mean, exuberant. What's exuberant? I mean, that's like next level, like this is good, right? And they praise God. Please get this. People in general liked what they saw. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were being saved. It says in general, people liked what they saw. And I got this picture, this image in my, in my mind. I'm like, people are looking in the window of the church. And I wonder what they see. 
Do they see exuberant joy? Do they see people just loving the heck out of other people? Do they see people selling properties and stuff to meet the needs? Are, are, are they seeing what was just described in those passages of Scripture? It says people liked what they saw, and God added to their number daily. So get this image. People are peeking in the windows here somewhere. I mean, they're, they're all closed up, but that's good. Because <laughs> they don't know what they're missing out. They're going to have to come in and find out. They're going to come after and feel it. They're going to feel that exuberance. They're peeking in. I remember, and, I, and, and this means I'm done, or I ran out of my battery, one or the other. We we're a pastor in, in, in East Stockton, and, and it was, you know, it was just a hard area. And we did our first Easter Fest there and just wanted just to love on the community. It wasn't really violent. It was just more impoverished. And we had like over a thousand people showed up. It was crazy. That was Easter, day before Easter on our church campus. We're like, man, this is awesome. And, you know, and we just thought Sunday was just going to be this, like break every numerical record. I mean, blow our mind. It was just going to be exponential growth and no looking back. We actually had zero visitors as a result of that outreach. Zero. Like, I don't think any pastor can say that. <laughs> no one from the outreach. And we knew because they had, car we knew who was there, right? In fact, our numbers were lower. It was just crazy. And I remember just like sitting in my office when they pray, like, God, I'm like, what? what's this about? And there's nothing wrong with doing those things. They're great, you know? And, and so we changed our, our why we do it. We just wanted to be a blessing. It wasn't even a church growth thing at that point. And God said, spoke very clear to me reading this passage right here. He said, the greatest church growth tool is a healthy church. It's a healthy church. Because healthy things grow, grow in different ways. Sometimes numbers, sometimes width, sometimes depth, sometimes financial. Some, it doesn't matter. Sometimes grow in favor. But healthy things grow. Healthy things have the ability in and of themselves to reproduce themselves. So we need to start focusing on healthy church, breaking bread, loving on each other, embracing each other, welcoming the hardest of the heart in our community, show no partiality, bringing them to the front row, giving them front row treatment. People are watching, they go, man, I, I wanna be a part of that. How do you sign me up for that? How do you sign me up for that? And why did, why did I said something earlier, see, I, I, I'm ending with what I see you guys doing. I, I believe you're the Acts 2 church and this isn't to pump you all up. I, I know you guys do this very, very well. You're so faithful, your roots are deep. Rooted people are fruitful people. Loving on people, shining bright in your community, meeting needs when they arise, doing family so well. And it's so attractive. It's so attractive because there's people looking in and they're saying, I want to be a part of that. The thought I lost a while back never came back to me, so... I'm sorry. I don't know if this is okay to say in church, but I'm going to quote Bob Marley and ask for forgiveness later. Then I'm going to hand you the mic. Let's light up the darkness. Let's go.